Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to be back. Um, I was at Elevation, and we had a week of teaching uh, folks about interim and transitional ministry at Zephyr Point, and despite the scenery, I think we actually might have taught them something. <laughs> um, we're so glad that you are here, both in person and on Zoom. Uh, we welcome you and uh, celebrate that you are walking with us. This is a place where all are welcome, where we hope dividing walls are broken down, and that you can enjoy uh, being here sharing and loving and, and living in grace. Because as we love to say, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Are there any other announcements other than the ones that you have in your bulletin? Nope. All right. So today our prayer, fam our prayer families this week, I should say, are Blanche and Sean Pointner and Beverly Preston. Our prayer churches are Olympic Valley Chapel UCC, and you'll never guess where they're located. <laughs> Olympic Valley. And New Liberation Presbyterian Church in San Francisco. And our birthday celebrants this week are Mike Sullivan and Elaine Palmer on July 23rd. <laughs> And Clarice Chandler and Jackson Burnett and Jay Ward on July 24th. Uh, Mary Ann Buffo on 25th. And Paul Fish on the 27th. That's quite a lot of birthdays. And happy birthday, happy anniversary to David and Donna Henry on July 26th. So let's sing our happy birthdays. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, everybody. Happy birthday to you. And many more. <laughs> Thank you, Dick. And Clarice, I hope you live up to what you just sang. <laughs> we all need a backup. We all need backup. Um, <laughs> I would like to invite you all to join me in the land acknowledgement. And uh, starting in August, we'll continue to share it aloud. But we have um, condensed it a little bit. So for those of you who thought it was a bit long, uh, bear with us. It's going to get shorter. <laughs> we continue the constant reminder with this land acknowledgement, our formal statement and public recognition of the indigenous peoples in this country who have been dispossessed. This statement acknowledges that cities, parks, homes, roads, and all of today's structures are built on indigenous peoples' ancestral homelands. Land acknowledgments are not about placing blame. They are the first steps toward building a more inclusive future where we eliminate the ongoing erasure of indigenous peoples' voices, lives, and history. Our land acknowledgment statement provides an opportunity to see the path for learning and for respect to blossom and grow.
Today I would like to remember the Reverend Anthony Wayne Myers. He was the pastor of the church where I grew up, which was uh, Congregational Church of Campbell in uh, Campbell, California. This church affiliated with the UCC during the time when I was there. Reverend Myers was always willing to take the time to talk to his parishioners, including the teenagers. <laughs> he was very intuitive. I remember the time when I made an appointment to see him right after my parents had separated. I was 15. I thought of a list of 21 questions for him, and they were all theological or moral, mostly along the lines of, is it wrong to do this or that? <laughs> but when I came in to see him, he asked me, first of all, how I was feeling about the separation, which I was doing my best not to think about. Um, he somehow sensed that my guilt-ridden questions were directly related to the separation, even though I hadn't realized it myself. Now at the time, this is going to be hard to believe, I was painfully shy until I took up adult choir, um, church choir directing when I was 28, and, but this was long before that. <laughs> so Reverend Myers would always notice if I were um, opening up and saying anything during the uh, youth group meetings that we had, and he would acknowledge it afterwards. And he also encouraged my music. He was... Um, great at positive reinforcement and at giving advice in a very succinct, non-judgmental way. He was very smart and knew his scripture, but he also had a whimsical side. And he had this stuffed bunny named Charlie Rabbit, and it was a puppet. And he would use it sometimes during the children's talks in church. And he in, had invented a personality for Charlie Rabbit, and he uh, told stories about him that were relevant to, <laughs> to Christian life. Uh, this reminds me of Reverend Kevin and his donkey, Idolette. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We do need to bring her in, I agree, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully she'll be here for worship next week. <laughs> so when it was time for me to go to seminary, I was proud to attend PSR, Pacific School of Religion, um, in Berkeley, which is a place that Reverend Myers and the church itself supported. One last thing that I think directs relately to, uh, I mean, how about relates directly to the practice of African libation. Reverend Myers would tell us about the early Christians who when they would gather uh, for worship or fellowship would always include an empty chair and that chair was for Jesus. So it was a way of remembering Jesus, of honoring him, and of invoking his presence. So, in African cultures and religions, the ritual of pouring libation is an important ceremonial tradition and a way of giving homage to the ancestors. Ancestors are not only respected in such cultures, but also invited to participate in all public functions. A prayer is offered in the form of pouring libations, calling the ancestors to attend. Let's call on our ancestors, giving thanks and honor to them. It's the plant's favorite time of the week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the wonderful tradition. <laughs> um, let us pray. Thank you, God, for those who went before us. Amen. Amen. Build a world where 
where love can grow and hope can enter in. To be the hands of healing and to plant the seeds of peace. Singing welcome, welcome to this place you are invited. To come and know God's grace, you are welcome. The love of God to share, because all of us are welcome here. All of us are in this place. Let us stand in body our spirit to call to worship. Welcome, welcome to the baggage we carry, the joys we share, the griefs we bear, and the worries we hold. Come, on, let us worship. The voice of God is calling us to come with all that we are and all that we carry to worship. Come, on, let us worship. God calls us to gather to receive grace in our gathering and to reordinate our us again to the ways of God. Come, let us worship. So come, members of the family of God, bring all that you are to be molded by grace, refocused towards love, and woven together as a community in Christ. together. Equip us, God, for the work of ministry, for the work involved with building unity of purpose and vision. Equip us with saints who will say yes to our will and yes to your way. Equip us, God, to journey with Jesus through life's uncertain paths. Equip us, God, with the maturity that comes from knowing you 
equipped as God to speak the truth in love even when it's uncomfortable. Equip us to move beyond a childish faith that whines for more while giving less. Equip us, O oh God, for the work of ministry that you call us to do. Please be seated. Good morning, church. Last week, we shared a brief history of the peace candle and the role Alice Gibson and Betty Brown played in its arrival here nearly 40 years ago. Today, we remember that when Pastor Christy Rimage left us in 2021, our parting gift to her was a peace candle to carry on the tradition of prayers for peace all over the world. Her parting gift to us was the singing bowl. We have come to welcome that moment of resonance each week as we tap the bowl. We some, sometimes the tone is soft and brief. Other times it is strong and lingering of what, for what seems to be the full minute or two. Today we are invited to listen to the tone of the bowl. Close your eyes if you are moved and feel its vibration. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us offer each other a sign of Christ's peace. This is our opportunity to offer our prayers of concern and joy, and we'll start as we always do with our folks on Zoom. Our church at home this morning includes Bill and Barbara Dexheimer, Merdell, and I assume Chuck Dibdell, and Rose Salarzano. So do any of you have prayer requests? Uh, Bill, we're not seeing your picture, so I don't know if you're waving at us or not. <laughs> if you unmute yourself if you want to. I don't see any. I would like to request prayer for uh, all the people in Gaza, the families that have lost members in the tragedy there, and the children especially. Lord, in your mercy. 
Are there any prayers here? Hi, Pat. Okay, you want it for yourself? Yes. All right. Lord, in your mercy. Okay. And we will give it. What? And we will give it. I hope so. Yeah. Um, I have a joy. I got to see my granddaughter from Tennessee this uh, last week. It was wonderful to see her. That's Robert's daughter. She's 22, and or no, she just she's just turned 23. <laughs> anyway, um, she's just beautiful. Um, enjoyed the visit with her and uh, her cousin, and then um, like to ask prayers still for my dad. Um, when we were down there, he was um, he was having some difficulty and. You know, I just get concerned. He's going to be 93 August 2nd, so he's he's not driving at this time. Mom is, but mm -hmm. just prayers for them on that too. Yeah. Um, prayers for Ben. He's he's having a difficult time. He's here, but he's having a difficult time, and I I. And he's listening to you. He is. Yeah. And he's nodding. Yeah. <laughs> so um, <laughs> that's what I ask. Lord, in your joys and in your mercy. Um, back in July 17, 1944, two ammunition ships were destroyed at Port Chicago, and over 340 men, mostly African Americans, were killed, and over 400 were injured. Um, and so, just this last week, 52 of those who uh, refused to go back and, and put ammunition sh on those ships were exon exonerated. Uh, and it, was, it took a long time. Yeah. It was an, of all, very few of the, of the, of, there were remnants of very few of the men. I mean, there was only four or five that they actually found uh, bodies of who yeah. It, uh, killed. What they, what caused all this is they gave leave to all the uh, white people who were who uh, were there when this uh, catastrophe occurred and gave them leave to you know go back to where they were uh, at home to get back to their normal life for, uh, after this catastrophe. They would not allow this for the African Americans and they were retained there on the base and told they had to resume uh, loading the ships. 250 refused and then there was a you know a court-martial. Mm -hmm. 52 were court-martialed and finally they were exonerated this week. Yes. Lord in your mercy. Any other prayers? Yes. Uh, we have a joy. Our daughter and her husband were here from Philadelphia for a quick visit. They're attending a wedding in Santa Cruz. So we saw them when we picked them up from the airport, and we'll see them again when we take them back to the airport. <laughs> but at least we get to see them. So <laughs> that's a joy. Yeah. Lord, in our joys and our travels. Any others? Yes. Karen. Bob is having cataract surgery on both eyes this Thursday. We appreciate your prayers. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Any other prayers? Oh, Donald. Hello? Oh. Oops. Hello? All right. Hello? Okay. Um, so continue to pray for my roommate slash friend, uh, Chris, um, his lawyer, I believe is in talks with the DA to see what happens from here. And I just pray that it will continue to be a good outcome in spite of the verdict. Um, you know, and, um, there is a silver lining, um, it's not going to affect his job at the post office. So um, I pray that it continues to work out. Um, there is a joy. Uh, I went to see my gastrinologist on Friday, 
And uh, as of today, I am 239 pounds. I lost 49 pounds of weight, so that's Yay. good. Um, yeah, thank God <laughs> for that. Um, I pray that my health continues to improve. Um, and also, um, school starts, and I pray that um, jobs will come. They've been coming over the summer too, so which is great. Um, and pray and pray for my sister. Uh, she recently got a job with a company in Sam in Sacramento, hmm. so I'm really happy for her for that. Um, and uh, so yeah, a lot of joys. Lord, in your mercy and your joys, you. hear our prayer. And I nobody's mentioned, but Carol said it was okay. Um, she was attending a, a Giants game this last week, and uh, the employee who wheeled her down to the curb was a little careless, and she ended up falling. Um, and she said that she looks like a raccoon right now. Um, but uh, keep her in your prayers and for healing for her and some discretion. So, Lord, in your mercy. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for the many ways in which you bless us. We give you thanks for the wonder of the creation that surrounds us. It is indeed a beautiful world to be good stewards of all that we have received. You bless us with gifts abundant and help us to use them wisely. And not only for ourselves, but for all of our siblings throughout the world so that all may know your grace and love. We pray for the folks that we have mentioned this morning out loud uh, for healing, for comfort, for guidance, and for strength. We pray, too, for those people we hold in the quiet of our hearts. Uh, let us lift them up to you as we pray together in silence. Gracious God, we thank you for calling us into being, for calling us the, into the body of Christ. Help us to be faithful to you in love and in grace. Help us to break down whatever divides us so that we indeed may be your household of God's people. And bind us together not only in love and grace, but in our prayers, and especially the prayer we have been taught. O most compassionate life giver, may we honor and praise you May we work with you to establish your new order of justice, peace, and love. Give us what we need for growth and help us through forgiving others to accept forgiveness. Strengthen us in the time of testing so that we may resist all evil. For all tenderness, strength, and love are yours now and forever. Amen. The Two Cents a Meal offering invites every member of the congregation to prayfully contribute a few cents at each meal to help alleviate hunger and poverty. Ideally, contributions come from living more simply so that others may simply live. Participation in Two Cents a Meal is also a commitment to share with others in response to Jesus' command. You give them something to eat. Daily participation is a reminder of the reality of hunger for millions of our sisters and brothers in the world. As the money accumulates, those participating become aware that small, regular acts can result in significant responses to hunger and that there is a great strength in working together with other Christians. 
Please bring your gifts forward during our True Sense of Meal hymn, The Summons. as this unseen and admit to what I mean in you and you in me will you love the you and you hide I call your name will you quell the fear inside and never be the same will you use the faith you found to reshape the world around through my sight and touch and sound in you and you in me. But your summons echoes true when I have to call your name. Let me turn and follow you and never be the same. In your company I'll go where your love and footsteps show. Thus I'll move and live and grow in you and you in me. Our first reading today is Jeremiah 23, 1 through 6. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away. You have not attended to them, so I will, I will attend to you oops, for your evil doings, says the Lord when I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of the lands where I have, I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shep shepherd them, and they shall no longer fear or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah uh, will, be, will be saved and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Our second reading is from the second chapter of Ephesians. We begin with the 11th verse, and this is one of my favorite passages in, in the New Testament. It is about Christ breaking down dividing walls of hostility. And let us listen. So then remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands, Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of, faith, of promise, 
having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances so that he might create in himself new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those, you of, those who were near. For through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God. Build upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him... The whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. This is a word of God. And all creation is a word of God. Well, as you know, in our recent news and uh, in the la over the last few years, walls have been greatly in attention. And sometimes we refer to those walls in literal ways, such as the border wall, border fence along our U.S. southern border. Sometimes we think of uh, the Berlin Wall. Um, and we, as we go back in history, we may think of the Maginot Line in World War I and um, Hadrian's Wall and the Great Wall of China. But other times we hear about walls that are more metaphorical such as racism, sexism, homophobia, and all those other isms, and of course the great political divide that so many of us feel nowadays. As I was thinking about walls, I was recalling uh, Robert Frost's poem, The Mending Wall, rather whimsical poem, and sometimes we remember that poem because of an aphorism that entered into our everyday English um, uh, from that poem, which is, good fences make good neighbors. Right? But the interesting thing is that I don't think that Robert Frost intended that aphorism to be the focus. In fact, as we read the poem, we realize that he is referring to something else. He's writing about his neighbor who wants to repair the loose stone wall that exists between their property. You know, the, those iconic stone walls that you can see throughout New England. And it is his neighbor who is the one that said, good fences make good neighbors. But I think the more interesting line in that poem is the very first line, which is, something there is that does not love a wall. And Robert Frost writes the poem, and in the body of his poem, he tries to persuade his neighbor to otherwise thinking. He says, spring plays mischief in me. I hope to put a notion into his head why do they make good neighbors? When I built a wall, I would want to know who I'm walling in and who I'm walling out and who I might, to whom I might give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall that wants it down. But alas, Robert Frost is unable to convince his neighbor and he says, I see him standing there with stones, holding firmly grasping stones at the top uh, in each hand, um, an old stone savage armed. There is, darkest, there is darkness, as it seems to me, not only of wood and the shade of trees. And I think like all good poems, Robert Frost touches on something universal. He realizes that we have this inclination in our nature to want to be separate, to want to hold off others, to see them sometimes even as evildoers from whom we must protect ourselves, and that we see our tribe as the best, and we have to protect it from the darkness of the world around us. And so walls become this way of proving that we are better and know how to protect ourselves. 
But at the same time, something there is that does not love a wall. And we begin to realize the futility of law, walls. For instance, that U.S. southern border wall came crashing down through wind and rain. Um, the Berlin Wall did not prove to be permanent. The Maginot Line in World War I was just passed by, as was Hadrian's Wall between England and, and Scotland. The Great Wall of China certainly didn't pre prevent the, the invasion of China. And of course, who doesn't know, and the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. So we're, we find ourselves in that kind of a push-pull area. We want to separate ourselves, acknowledge the superiority of our tribe, and protect ourselves. Yet at the same time, we know that our spiritual life and Christ are calling us towards a unity, calling us towards being people who do not exclude, who welcome and understand that God does not intend us to be separate from one another in this good creation. I don't think that lesson is wasted on the writer, the Pauline writer to the Ephesians. He is referring to that first divide in the, in the Christian church, which was between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. And of course, the Jewish Christians felt that they were better Christians because they had adhered to the law. They had obeyed the Torah. And that those Gentile Christians, before they even became Christian, were far off from God, if that, and that was the best they could claim. So the writer to the Ephesians uses a subtle image there about the wall of hostility, and he may be referring to what happened in Holy Week. Remember? Jesus comes to Jerusalem, and what's the, one of the first things he, do, he does is he goes to the temple and he overturns the tables of the money changers. This all would have happened in uh, the, the court of the Gentiles. And we have to see that the problem here is that the house of God is not simply just the temple. But the temple was also used as an opportunity to offer sacrifices to God, to please God. And so the animals that had to be sacrificed had to be perfect. And the priests were more than happy to provide those perfect animals for a price. But the dilemma is that most people carried around Roman money, right? And if you have seen pictures of Roman coins, you know that on them they bear the inscription of the emperor at the time that the coin was minted. And the back of the coin implies that the emperor is a god. And of course, Faithful Jews know the Ten Commandments. You do not have other gods before me, and you do not produce idols, images. So what is one to do? Well, somebody figured out what we could do is we can create an in-house currency for the temple that does not have any images on it. And you can exchange those Roman coins for temple money to buy your perfect animal. Genius. Everybody makes a profit. The priests make a profit selling their animals, and the money changers make a profit exchanging the coins. Of course, the problem is the exchange rate smacks of usury, and that would be an injustice to the poorest of those worshiping. You begin to understand why Jesus was a tad upset. In the Gospel of Mark, when Jesus overturns the tables, he's, he cries out, my house is to be a house of prayer for all nations. For all nations. And what he realizes is that this all is happening in the court of Gentiles, where everybody in the world could come. But of course, they're not allowed to go any further into the temple. If they tried to enter into the court of the women, they would have been halted. In fact, there was supposed to be an inscription on the wall by that entrance that said that if you're not of Jewish descent, you face death. No wonder 
we see why Jesus is so upset and how the writer to the Ephesians captures his anguish. Because here are the people of the world coming to this house of prayer for all nations, and what do they see? Corruption and separation. So the writer to the Ephesians goes on to say it is the cross of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, that crashes down that, that wall of hostility so that those who are far off and those who are near can come together and be one people. That we, together, become the new temple. Now the writer to the Ephesians, of course, is speaking of an ideal. And so how do we do? Well, that, that wall between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians was the first of great separations in the church. We know more recently is that people of color and uh, people, uh, white people did not want to see that wall continued in the modern era. And through the marches and protests of black preachers and white preachers, even in negotiations with leaders of Congress, we finally, in the White House, we finally started breaking down that wall of separation. Still not done with it yet, but maybe a little closer. And of course, more recently, we've had advocates for gay and trans people helping to break down those walls but we still persist. In recent history, I think one of the great ironies was that as the Berlin Wall was coming down, a 66-mile fence of separation was being constructed on the U.S. southern border between Mexico and the United States from San Diego to the Pacific Ocean. And as we know, that wall is still continually being added on and it becomes a point of controversy. And that we still construct metaphorical walls. A week ago, yesterday, there was a tragedy. And yet within hours of that tragedy, <clears throat> national leaders were proclaiming that the opposition were responsible. Building a metaphorical wall between them and us. Fortunately, there were some wise voices reminding us that we are one nation. We're supposed to be together. So how do we treat that passage from Ephesians? Do we, intrude, do we truly let the, the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ break down our walls of hostility? Do we see that we are called to be a people who are from near and far brought together? And that we, we do not have the only answer to God's intent. But rather it is Christ and that love through God's work that we are being brought together into one body. Of course, we, we resist. Good fences make good neighbors. Christ, though, says that is not what is intended. That instead, Christ calls all everyone into this, that we are to become a household of God's people, that together we make a new temple where we live in grace and love. Amen. Returning um, our gifts to God, may we take the words we have heard into our hearts and offer our gifts in gratitude, celebrating God's steadfast love that endures forever. Please bring your gifts forward during the offertory. Inst uh, instructions for online giving via Zelle and regular mail are included in the announcements, e blasts and newsletter. Divine love flowing through us blesses the multitudes, all that we are and all that we give and all that we receive.
us align our hearts with your divine rhythm. Guide us to sing your praises boldly, inviting others to join in the song of your love. May our worship be a testament to your enduring grace. Empower us to love as you do. Bless these offerings to our community and beyond. Amen. Amen. I will come to you in the silence. I will lift you from all your fear. You will hear my voice. I claim you as my choice. Be still and know I am here. Do not be afraid. I am with you. Each by name. Come and follow me. I will bring you home. I love you and you are mine. I am hope for all who are hopeless. I am eyes for all who want to see. In the shadow of the night, I will be your light. Come round and rest in me. Do not be afraid, I am with you. I have called you each by name. Come and follow me. I will bring you home. I love you and you are mine. I am strength for all the despairing, healing for the ones who dwell in shame. All the blind will see 
the lame will all run free, and all will know my name. Do not be afraid, I am with you. I have called you each by name. Come and follow me, I will bring you home. I love you and you are mine. I am the word that leads all to freedom. I am the peace the world cannot give. I will call your name, embracing all your praying. Stand up now, walk and live. Do not be afraid, I am with you. I have called you each by name. Come and follow me, I will bring you home. I love you and you are mine. May God gives, give us light to guide us, courage to support us, and love to unite us, now and always. We go into the world in peace, to love and serve the Lord. Let your mighty outstretched arms, O Lord God, be your defense, your mercy and loving kindness in Jesus Christ, your dear Son, our Savior, your true word of instruction, the grace in your life-giving spirit, your comfort and consolation to the end and to the end, through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Friends, go out into the world knowing that God calls us together not to build walls, but to be one holy people, celebrating God's love and justice in the world. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.